Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, since not everybody was here yesterday, um, let me welcome you again and uh, um, give a notice of a wonderful week we're having and thank again uh, to Anne to be avail make herself available in a really busy schedule to share with us the entire week of reflections of a fantastic masterclass and a series of lectures that's uh, Olympic, to say the least. Uh, and as uh, now to that all of you know, uh, influential as uh, few people uh, uh, contemporary academic scene are, uh, influential to many of us in Portugal too, uh, groundbreaking in putting uh, an ethnographic approach to the archives and making the archive uh, dignified subject of stu study other than uh, just a place to study and uh, collect, and uh, a creator of um, very unique and original approaches to a variety of topics that emerged from her study on uh, colonial um, colonial histories. Today we're having the talk on archival labor, recrafting colonial histories. Thank you very much, Anne, for being here. Thank you. I feel like I feel like this is an endurance test for some of you. I really do. I really apologize. I didn't know how many people might be here that were not part of the seminar. So I obviously, I have to repeat things that are part of the seminar. But let's just hope that those repetitions are not too trying for you, um, because they're so much a part of, of these strategies of, um, of engagement that I talked about this morning. This is a bit of a long paper, because it's on the edges of in the archive and outside of it at the same time. And it was really a really difficult exploration for me, an exciting one. So let's, let's hope that I can get through most of it. We'll, we'll, we'll try. So these colonial archives are unwieldy beings that are not things at all. Now we know that, right? They're products of political power, tedious documentations, extraneous details, bureaucratic squabbles, mental exactions, and their violences in the making. They are strewn with unspoken violations, predations, dispossessions, couched in the civilities of compassion and good works. They are the evidence and witness to inequalities of possibility that make up what they're constitutive of, the colonial disorder of things. So that's a baseline of how I think of of many of these archives. Importantly, they are not benign sources, as we know, but technologies of rule on themselves. They are neither originary fonts um, nor sources of fact to be extracted and showcased as coveted jewels, apart from where they came. Working on Dutch, French, and US imperial formations for so many decades has come with some critical lessons. One is that the label we bring to archival work is, as I said this morning, not an extractive enterprise, but an ethnographic one. And we tried to excavate a bit what that could possibly mean. This latter enterprise attends to the densities, these are two words I really like, densities and distributions, right? In which the archives were produced, to their tone and temper, to how they moved, to the logic of appended documents and accumulations to what kinds of authorizations and what claims about causation, something we didn't talk about this morning, they served. The second lesson in which I invest is not to too hurriedly to read against the grain of these archives, but to read with their grit and along their grain for the logic of their making, for the conditions of production for not only their content, but the commanding priorities of their form. So in such a venture, the details and the slips of the pen matter a lot. Acerbic asides, crossed out words and marginalia, are storied notations in the making of truth claims. It's not that historians haven't attended to these asides. The question is rather, and this is the question, how to analytically mobilize these interceptions and what subjacent sensibilities we might use then to trace. Analytic traction adheres both 
in rote repetition, repetition. And that's something that's really interesting. There is traction in repetition and the deadening weight of official ease. But what constitutes context, as I said yesterday, is thorny. Historians, like anthropologists, are schooled to look for context, somehow imagining that getting the context is the key to the event. But this is, in fact, I think, a misleading way to broach the complex movement of archives. For one could argue as easily that what's far more important are the quixotic shifts of what constituted context for <laughs> colonial agents themselves. Attending to choices of context offer occasion to explore epistemic commitments of colonial actors and agents, what people thought they needed to know, as I've said so many times, how they knew it, what they thought they needed to know, how they knew it. In Sumatra's plantation belt of Delhi, where most of my early ethnographic and historical work was for long centers, it was no surprise that in 1876, murder of a white planter's wife was explained by different actors and witnesses in such different ways. Each rendition of the story by an ex civil servant, by a military commander, more versed and concerned over the fears of Islam and the Aceh war to the north, by a European planters bent on protecting their autonomy. Archival stories, then, such as these, trace archival maps, not only with different coordinates, contexts, and different plots, each depends on distinct notions of reliable evidence, whose evidence might garner authority, whose could be qualified and dismissed or not. What new colonial histories that can emerge are not dependent on then an archives as sources alone. That's OK. Those are just squeaky shoes. They are. Uh, but on the appreciation that the very production of documents and the genres in which they appear these commissions, these semi-official correspondence, discrete reports, classified inquiries, are not just traces of colonial bureaucrats securing their jobs. These are powerful instruments of race making, where new classifications were tried out, where selective knowledge and disregard, rather than more knowledge, could confer more power. And that's a really important point that Jim Scott makes in Seeing Like a State. It's not how much information you have, it's how you parse that information down to a category that's operative. If an historical event, as I said, is, is, um, can be summarized as a breach of the self-evidence, that which defies the rules and prescriptions of what came before, that which disrupts the unquestioned and received prescriptions that make up colonial common sense, it's precisely in identifying these disquieting moments that should direct our methodological attention. We've got a lot to learn about the nature of colonial rule and it's the dispositions it engendered from the right elite forms in which it was managed. As Michel de Certeau 40 years ago said, and as we noted today, though we're not quite sure yet if we know exactly what it means, transformation of archival activity is the point of departure and condition for a new history. So I think we have to those of us in the seminar have to figure out over the next two days exactly what that means, what that kind of transformation is going to entail. Archivists seem to know this already, but we who want to use the archives, for the most part, do, do not, and that is historians and anthropologists mostly. What de Certeau presently had in mind with the effects that computers, remember he's writing this early piece that I'm referring to, the historiographic operation in 1974, he, what were the effects that computers and digitization had on our archives were imagined to be. But I think one can take his observation to create another future for writing colonial histories otherwise. Archival activity is being transformed as we speak by the sorts of questions we ask of them. And that is really the bottom line, that we are really asking questions of them in another way with these archives as subjects of inquiry in themselves. So on this pre premise, we might track the colonial order of things as seen through the record of archival production to ask what insights into the social imaginaries of colonial rule might be gained from attending not only to this content, but to its form. Treating archival archiving as process, then, 
And that's not altogether clear what I mean by process, but we can discuss that more. Rather than archives as things, has a fan-like effect, showing them to be skewed and biased sources, which is what we've done in colonial historiography for so long. Oh, they're so biased, they're so racist, they're so sexist, they're so homophobic. Doesn't actually do very much. As process, rather, they emerge as entry points for understanding the collusion of changing regimes of truth. The, I hope that's not my phone. The logics and sensibilities that join what historians have long taken to be unrelated histories and unrelated things. I've written, as I've told the seminar, about kindergartens and nurseries for European or Indo children, domestic service in colonial homes, orphanages for wayward mixed blood youth, only in part out of an interest of my own. And everyone always assumed it's because I was a feminist. Right, that's why I was writing about it. Couldn't be of any interest otherwise. What drew me to these concerns was their presence and placement, often dead center in administrative archives and most pointedly in the making of race. It was the ministers of colonies, governor generals for whom these sites and subjects mattered so much. The very location of these documents resituates what counts as a security concern. It makes the breadth, the, makes sense of the breadth of activities the watchmen of empire thought necessary to manage. In short, it allows us to track what domains of the intimate, and this was one of the starting points for almost all my work 25 years ago, where does intimacy lie? Where both private and public, within the purview of governance, because they were thought to be sites of potential danger to a racialized order, always precariously outside colonial control. Or let us take another set of unintelligibilities that render problematic a transparent narrative of a particular event. In along the archival grain, I return to that event that we talked about today, about the stress of family arrangements, where the details every, every day spilled over the edges of official documents as authorities in 1848 scrambled to learn what they could really know about people's sentiments and concerns. For what arrested me was that they asked themselves and others again and again whether this demonstration of Indo and white city fathers was confined to local matters, family attachments, political rights, or the contagious effect of something else, reverberation of Europe's spring 1848 revolutions among the middle class and the working poor. The archival moment here is not, and that is really what's distinct about how I tried to treat it in Along the Archival Grain, it's not what happened at the demonstration in 1848, but in the movement of the documents themselves, of contradictory assessments, of uncertainty about what authorities thought it meant and where it might go. Their mounting disquiet was evident in circulation of documents, in where and to whom reports were sent. If archival science was produced out of the rationality of a bureaucracy, as Max Weber has taught us so well, there is as much in the circulation of documents that suggests it was not rationality alone. In short, it is work with the archives, not in them. And that that preposition changes the story altogether. It's working with them and not in them, nor abstract theory that can generate new conceptual formations. It's in refashioning and reworking what constitutes the boundaries, and this is where the new project went and is gone, of the colonial archive and how we conceive of content. For Aristotle, the historian's task was to tell about things that have been, and poets about things as they might be. But those of us who work on colonial histories know better. Colonial historiographies may be written in the past tense, but the colonial documents, as again we talked about this morning, some of us, are not. They cannot be broached in the passé composé. For these are documents that were visions of what a colony could be, 
The conditional tense, this if only x then y is possible, conveyed more than prevailing fears. It taps into the political logics of governance, the forms of political reason that cut across metropole and colony. But working inside and with colonial documents is never enough. For doing so, I think we remain within the confined space already, already designated for us. What I've grappled with for years is how we might create a colonial archive of our own that is not mapped by officials themselves. Here I've sought to think differently about what a colony is, to ask what unrealized histories might be gleaned by exploring the portability of documents and the trail of citations. So that's one of the key things that I keep trying to do, is follow the citations in a document, not the movement of the document itself, right? but the trail of its citations that transgress imperial borders and colonial sites. The problematic is straightforward. What might a genealogy of imperial practices look like that neither succumbs to a teleology of the present, as we know it now, because we could write it that way, nor one restricted to the police categories of colonial archives themselves? Well, such a venture opens to the political logics, the joint penal and social reform in the mid-19th century, and ultimately, the political matrix that joins colonies and camps. Archival labor of this sort provides lessons of apprenticeship in reading along the grain for a much wider set of histories than those derived from cataloged archives alone. And that's what i am really been trying to work through archival labor makes one attend differently to reference within documents and then the cross-reference between them. It trains our analytic sensibilities or on placement and on the act of cribbing. It trains one to be attentive to track how histories are made, fixed, rewritten in the very process of merely reporting an event. Here I've sought to look to the political lives of documents. It's a kind of term that has helped me think with it. Does it have a political life? To the logics that underwrite their citations, when things don't get cited, they don't pass on. Not least the powerful work of comparison. And what it tells us about how commensurabilities are drawn across seemingly disparate sites. Tracking what colonies were and intended to be, it attends carefully to this future conditional tense as it charts out a new kind of geopolitical map, not the map that the empire, the Dutch empire, the Portuguese, has written for itself. That spans both the colonial archives proper as well as those hovered outside its constricted edges to think differently about the scale and scope of imperial formations and their unstable political logics. That is what I've been trying to do, is change the basic scale and scope and not be confined by what's within the green borders or the red borders of the British Empire or the blue ones of the US um, trusteeships and unincorporated territory. It wrestles with the challenge to think what methodological renovations and innovations we might need to write histories that yield neither to smooth continuities nor to abrupt epical breaks. And this is a really important point that I'm not actually going to have time for because then I won't have time for any of the paper. But the way in which Foucault's understanding of genealogy has been understood in the archaeology knowledge is that his, his work's all about disruptions and what he was trying to get again, against, work against with seamlessness. I think it's neither of those. I think what Foucault was actually doing again and again was to see how things get recuperated in different form, in what I call this recursive process that I spoke about. Um, but that capture this uneven, recursive qualities of the visions and practices that imperial formations have animated, both what they succeeded and failed to put in place. I see such new colonial histories not as a rehearsal or condemnation of the past, but rather as tracing 
the jagged liniments, some of the deep fault lines of our world today, in which we have camps and former colonies and present colonies all over the place. The political life of a document. Could I get some water, please? Thank you. There are many ways, I think, to imagine the political life of a document. We might explore the relations it forged, the places that document inhabited, the sentiments it provoked, or the hands, thank you so much, it passed through. And when I set out this speculation, the speculation is one which I worked with as I was trying to think these documents, Alternately, that life might manifest in the singular boldness of the intervention made at the time of writing. Again, an intervention. Or the affective relations mobilized or bore witness to. Or it might be found in the contrast between an unremarked life when it first came into being and its capacity upon later retrieval to breathe sustenance into political truths long denied or demands unfulfilled. So I'm looking at some documents that were kind of dead in the water when they first got set out and then get pulled to the present in a different way as evidence of something that's become more pertinent. But in thinking about the political life of a document here, I engage in another sort of exercise with another set of questions in mind. Can a public document have a political life if it is rarely referenced or elevated to the noteworthy status that warrants quotation or censor? Can its political life be lodged in its unexceptional quality in the density of similar documents that surround it in its rehearsal of common refrains? The answer depends on what a life is imagined to be. Here I think of the life of a document as the kinships it recognizes, the genealogies it may ignore, and the alliances it calls up and commands. And this strategy has been extraordinary for me in this work on the colony. Here I think of a life as a lively node of connectivities. That's what I'm looking for, is connectivities. Concerns and preoccupations shared in exchange, commensurability sought and assumed, proximate and distant affiliations affirmed. All these give contour to futures aborted and tenacious attachments that may longer be. What interests me are documents that strain and push on our conceptual categories, that don't leave everything flat where they were when we started, right? That disturb our contemporary common sense about what words belong with what things, that disrupt the very confident lineages that students of European and colonial history so assuredly trace that call into question the notion of context, confounding what we imagine should be deemed in and out of place. So that's what I want to disrupt, is not what everything, what all so far has told me what's in place, but why something is all of a sudden considered out of place. So I'm looking at a particular document that got me going that I found about 25 years ago and it was nothing spectacular at all. It's unsettling precisely because its citations and comparisons seem unfamiliar, counterintuitive, and out of place. It locates what were called agricultural colonies, and this may be a familiar term to some of you who speak French, les colonies agricoles, for impoverished, orphaned, abandoned, or delinquent children and youth, held as one of the most successful social reformist projects of mid-19th century Europe. Absolutely nothing to do with empire and colonialism on the face of it. In an archival field and political web of linkages that prompt historians of European child welfare and those who work on Algerian military camps to reconsider both in a broader arc of governance as part of a wider imperial domain. So what I'm trying to do is show the way these link up in a highly bizarre way. It is a document whose very content breaches institutional forms that seem incommensurable in our present. 
absolutely you'd never say this is part of empire. It's in these couplings and these affiliations that I broach the multiple arts of imperial governance and the shifting geographies of imperial interventions, a geopolitical topography carved out of the distribution of containments of people. This is key for me. Containments of people, strategies of displacement, definitions of security, and tactics of defense. So before I go and say, this is what a colony is, this is what empire is, I'm looking at these forms of containment and arrest. To, together, they make up the genealogies of what I call the imperial modern. It's a term I've used to think through some of the principles and practices by which such institutional arrangements were blatantly and obliquely joined in relations of force and philanthropy, of care and coercion, of curative and punitive instruments of constraint and enclosure that were forged, fumbled, dismissed, reversed, and reworked again. So all of those are some of the, of the uh, kinds of events that circulate around these various forms of colonie. So let me tell you briefly something about the document. I'm only halfway through the paper. Is that okay? It's a public document. It's not in the archives. No archival fetishism here. It's available in libraries, not many, granted. It's an essay of some 500 pages in four volumes, written by a certain Count Comte de Tourdonnet. Never find his first name, A. de Tourdonnet, printed in Paris in 1863 under the title, an essay on the education of poor children, semicolon, the agricultural colonies. It was neither an exceptional essay nor the first of its kind, rather part of a proliferating, as I was to learn, if minor genre of reformist writing from the corridors of law, penal reform, and philanthropy, most marked between the 1830s and 1880s, intensifying after the revolutions of 1848 throughout Europe in ostensible response to the political threats such disorder was seen to pose, literally tens and thousands of pages of detailed commissions, reports, multi-sided surveys were produced to assess, project, give substance to the viability and widely shared conviction that a return to agriculture and an attachment to land and labor were economic, political, and moral solutions to alleviate urban pauperism, quell the revolutionary potential of Europe's your urban masses, and avert a new generation of wayward and abandoned children and youth who would otherwise turn to revolt and crime. So these are familiar to you in some sense, um, of the kind of reformist projects these were about. The children's colonie agricole, thus described, were understood as reformist projects, first of all, in and for France, designed to remove children from adult prisons, that was one of the big moves, and rescue them from moral harm. It is in this general context that they've long been studied, and almost all the books on them, which are really fascinating just to be part of, we were just talking about this, part of this archive that was on them, right, um, historians have emphasized that they had pedagogic goals. Some others said they were depots of mendacity, that they were awful places. Nor did social reformers agree on what they were. A pedagogic model of relief, social relief circulated, was continually contaminated by what some people saw was incarceration. So over and again, we keep getting incarceration reform, incarceration, dressage of the body, severe punishment if the training was not fully adhered to or achieved. Several such movement revealing a striking observation. How many features of what de Tourdonné would distinguish as religious colonies, military colonies, settler colonies, colonies de défrichement, and what he called charitable agricultural colonies for children were sustained by principles and procedures shared among them. When these were 
to us, totally disparate phenomena. This morphing and meshing of principles and practices were key features of how this knowledge was assembled and disseminated across the globe. If anything, the Tour de Nez essay might rather serve, and this is how I've used it, as a diagnostic, not of something that I know and that I've imposed, but of the multiple logics that underwrote them and thus of what constituted a, a colony and who belonged in them. So do you see what I'm trying to do here? Instead of take my definition of a colony, how we've defined it in colonial studies or post-colonial studies, I'm trying to take it from its moments of emergence. Orphans, children who had stolen a loaf, a loaf of bread, and those who slept under the bridges of Paris came under one rubric and one system of internment in part because they were subsumed under the same constellation of political logics to deter a new generation through rehabilitation from becoming enemies of the state. That was a term used again and again, enemies of the state, to defend society, Il de Faux de Fondre la Société, 1976, College of France Lectures, Foucault, from a potential threat, and to secure France's colonies with productive and loyal settlers. This is where it comes in. One of the most famous and allegedly most successful was the Colonie Agricole et Penitentiaire of Maitre. And I don't know if any of you remember Maitre in Discipline and Punish of Foucault. Lauded as exemplary from its founding in 1840, none was more often visited, depicted, discussed by dignitaries, officials from Britain, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, the US. Maitre's founder, the Met, a former lawyer, believed his motivation provided a moral mission to assure that poor, abandoned, and delinquent children should not be just punished but saved and redeemed as citoyens through strict discipline, agricultural labor, and supervision based on a familial model whose guardians would be assigned as fathers. That's the term he used to train them. Maitre quickly became the paragon of private in initiatives and social reform. Its fame was not accidental. De Metz was a philanthropic entrepreneur who encouraged high-placed visitors, and he actually built a hotel de colonie right outside the colony's grounds. Copying Maitre became virtually obligatory. I had absolutely no idea how many of these colonies there were splayed throughout Europe and Eastern Europe as well to procure funding for the 60-odd establishments created. Such colonies agricoles were to be seedbeds, as they were called, to raise honest citizens and hardworking laborers with limited aspirations by removing them from an, the unhealthy immoral landscape. Well, if these agricultural colonies had iconic status, and they did in the mid-19th century, they have since been endowed with much more not because of their reformist success. They were totally unsuccessful in so many ways, but because Michel Foucault signaled out maitre in discipline and punish to mark what he called the completion of the carceral system. And condensation, as he put it, I love this, of the art of punishing that is still more or less our own, unquote as he saw it concentrating all the coercive technologies of comportment and behavior through meticulous and multiple forms of training. For its staff, its technicians of behavior, as he called them, and its colon, C-O-L-O-N, its colonists, the children themselves. In his hyperbolic style, he dubbed it the first training college in pure discipline. Well, it wasn't, and in the art of power relations. But Maitre in the Colonie Agricole that so riveted de Tourdonné was also something else, central to Foucault's larger conceptual project, part of what he called a whole series of institutions that constituted what he famously called the carceral archipelago, a gradated, far-reaching network of compact and diffuse institutions and methods that were to be curative and punitive. 
For Foucault, this was part of a new social apparatus, a subtle gradated carceral net, a form of modern discipline that turned away from the spectacle of punishment, as we know, as we know from the opening of the way discipline and punish opens, to the isolation of the cell. As an emergent vehicle in the power of normalization, this is where normalization starts to come in for him, it collapsed into a single entity, the multiple dangers of social disorder, deviance, madness, and crime that we talked about. Well, this is a compelling and now famous story, and I won't go into it more, though it, I do in, in, in the book, but also it's a partial one. It's schematic, and it's really skewed in time and place. Maitre was actually a node in a network many of whose linkages Foucault chose to bypass, or at least had not yet sought to name. And this is a question, whether Foucault actually knew what was going on with a place like Maitre. What was new for him about Maitre was how effectively it combined multiple models outside of and within institutions, because that's what the carceral archipelago is. It's a metaphor for him, that's all. And their dispersal across a broad societal domain well, French historians were really quick to critique him, noting that Maitre was unique with practices that were almost never followed. Unperturbed, Foucault said, you've missed my point entirely. His response as to why he chose the prison as a center of a new penal system, system that is our own, and not deportation or to the penal colonies is very curious. Right? He kept those outside of his domain. Despite his emphasis on gradations of punitive and curative arrangements within the carceral archipelago, those beyond Northern Europe had no interest for him. Settler colonies made up of French soldiers were simultaneous at exactly the same time. Labor camps of Europeans that served colonial public work projects. And most notably, penal colonies like those in New Caledonia, and French Guiana, scattered across the topographies of Europe's empires, were outside of his frame. As the anthropologist Peter Redfield rightly notes, penal colonies were not marginal spaces on the edge of the nation. They were central technologies of it. Still, for Foucault, these kinds of colonies and this is so important to get the logic in which he's operating. That's how we get inside this archival space. These kinds of colonies remained outside his territorial, political, and analytic frame. In brief mention of the possibility of a broader carceral net in discipline and punish, he writes this, that the example of colonization comes to mind. That's exactly his line, the example of colonization comes to mind, but then he dismisses it. He says, it's not the most convincing example. Now, my question is, the most convincing example of what? It's not the most convincing example of the carceral archipelago. It's not the most convincing example of discipline, of normalization, perhaps. In the one reference to colonialism, he dismisses all the projects that were drawn up in the colonies, noting, he says, that in fact deportation to Guyana or later to New Caledonia had no real, <clears throat> and I really underscore this, no real economic importance, unquote. Well, this really is strange too, because economic efficiency, as we know, was never a sufficient benchmark to account for the political imaginaries that Foucault sought to name. Right? He never said the bottom line is, a, is some reductionist Marxism and that it's economic efficiency that accounts for these relations of power. Failed projects for Foucault were the very fabric of experimentation in crucial sites of, as he put it, political dreams, indices of the anxieties and fears that produce the very categories of persons that had to be contained. One methodological insight of genealogy, then, is precisely what we talked about earlier today, a refusal to distinguish among the implemented, the failed, and the imagined. So these 
This archive that I'm mapping and remapping and remaking includes all of those. Genealogy traces history in a piecemeal fashion from alien forms. And this is exactly what Di Tourdonné did. Although Algeria was formally excluded as an overseas penal colony in 1854, it was not excluded as a site of children's colonies agricole in the very same years. In fact, he and others promoted Algeria as a renewed and excellent site for these colonies. Something seems really, really bizarre here. Such colonies dotted rural France, serving to raise strapling youths with, as these reports put it, with a love of the sweat of labor and a ready love of the land. These were imagined to become the fodder for colonizing Algeria and for France's expanding empire. So this almost rewrites the history of settler colonialism. It almost rewrites the failed efforts. Instead of doing what's been going on the last few years, there's settler colonialism out here, says Wolf, and there's, you know, there's an, every other kind of colonialism here. Actually, these were negotiations. These were contests. These were conflicts over what kind was going to be forged and what not. De Tourdonnet places Maitre in another frame, not the frame Foucault does. He notes the transplantation, I quote, of welfare children in Algeria was nothing new. Huge. I'm going, wait a minute. I thought 1840 was the moment of the carceral archipelago of Foucault. He says nothing new in the 1860s. There were already these experimented in 1832, 1852, 1856, to, as he put it, bind destitute French children to Algeria in proposals that would not produce flabby townsmen, but robust workers, hardened to fatigue, who have the courage for the job, for whom labor is the life of their organs. I mean, this is a settler model. Specific enterprises failed again and again, but what's more striking is the resilient commitment to a depositif, to a technology, to a technique, to a form of displacement and dislocation, of banishments that marked imperial expansion. Well, this is a truncated account, a much, much shorter than actually the kind of details of all the places it went that I can give. But I think the point should be clear, and the point I want to make to you today. This shift of function produced an experimental space in which an agricultural colony could serve as a military zone, and a penal institution could be transformed into a normal civilian colonial settlement. These were not fixed at any one time. Transp transpositions of function brought penality, philanthropy, social welfare, and imperial conquest and intervention into proximity and adjacency, mixing strategies that have lasted long past the mid-19th century often referred to as a double system to disgorge France's carceral institutions, because they were overloaded, and to protect the social and political order through colonial deportation. So colonial deportation was totally tied up as a national project. Such observations call into question both Agamben and Foucault's selective genealogies that ignore the deeper archive of empire that many of you are exploring with indentured labor here and what I find so exciting in your work. Rehabilitation camps, reconcentration camps, as they were called, right, um, in Cuba, forced labor colonies, agricultural colonies for children were only as provisional and exceptional as imperial formations themselves. They were constantly under change. They were forms of enclosure and containment that were part of the very architecture of empire. That's what I want to argue. Not vestiges of leftover systems. Oh, they were too early. The penal colonies were, are not really modern, right? The labor camps aren't really modern. As I'll discuss in the public talk tomorrow, they're very modern. Not vestiges of earlier systems of order and control. They're predicated 
on something that's very modern, on moving categories and populations that create new subjects that must be relocated to be productive, dispossessed to be modern, disciplined to be independent, converted to be really human, stripped of old cultural bearings to be good modern citizens, and coerced into all those positions to be free. That that formulation for me is where that linkage is cast. Nor were these confined, it's not much longer, I promise, <laughs> to nation states, as Agamben claims, but geographic arrangements fundamental to defining the racial distributions of the imperial modern. One could imagine that the carceral archipelago would look different in this new analytic space, that it would perhaps not have excluded the gulag as part of the modern. The gulag archipelago by uh, Sojanets, yeah, thank you, was, was written just the year before that, that Foucault was referring to this, this gulag archipelago. They would perhaps not have excluded it, nor the military-run agricultural colonies of Algeria, totally excluded by Foucault, nor the reestablishment because they were reestablished of penal colonies in French Guiana and New Caledonia, nor would it have excluded something I talked about yesterday, the isolated forest hamlets where the Harkis, Algerians who served as an auxiliary military for the French during the Algerian War, were dumped for decades throughout rural France. These would have been seen as part of these sites of confinement, nor might it have looked past the successive waves of populations housed in the internment camps of Larzac in France that grew out of 19th century tradi traditions of internment and that, that had Jews in them at one time, um, 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 migrants at another, gypsies at another. We would do well not to wait, follow the ease with which Agamben generalizes the camp. Genealogy and historical specificity tell another tale, one animated by multiple logics at play. As Redfield notes, these logics of penal colony shifted over and again, and that's what I think is so great about Redfield's insight, about Peter's insight, between the need to colonize, the need to punish, and the need to reform. These all went together. In the logics of governance, nothing has been more normalized than the varied forms of colony and camp, whose genealogies have long linked defensive society against its dangerous elements to the varied security tactics of imperial formations. In such an imperial genealogy, again, not traced through the archive of empire proper, but through these other connectivities made in the documents themselves, not what the colonial official archive tells you belongs to the colony and what doesn't, the relevant event of marginity is not Maitre, 1840, opening, or the advent of the colonies agricoles. It's the elaboration of a history of the colonies agricoles through a broader geopolitical space, what I've called this carceral archipelago of empire, right? Changes in the penal system were tethered to revised colonizing projects in nearly every decade of the 19th and 20th century. And the abutment of colonies and camp, whether we're talking about Israel and, and, and Palestine, whether we're talking about Indonesia and its Boro Island, all over the place we have colony and camp pushed up against one another. Such a perspective reveals new entanglements between institutions and visions whose histories have been severed and pulled apart. A new cartography entails a newly constituted archive and a new conceptual map. And these are the three things that I've been trying to do and get across again and again. A new cartography, a newly constituted archive, and therefore a redrawing on what that Portuguese map may actually look like. With shared knowledge, newly fashioned recombinations of experiments in discipline defense, and biosecurity. De Tordonnet's extended essay on Ecole Agricole alerts us to just this. And again, I'm 
cutting this very quick, as it benignly endeavors to situate Les Colonies Agricoles as potential sites for securing imperial frontiers, as instrumental in the imperial disposition of land and the military strategies designed to call on children from those agricultural colonies and on freed penal labor in Guyana as a front line of settler colonialism. So they're using the penal colony, the freed penal colony laborers for settled, settled colon, with the ad colon serving as a reserve army of defense. We, we're getting this totally matched of military and penal over and again. What is key to the connections that link these coercive and curative projects, that which muddles the space between colony and camp, is a political matrix of what I call, and I mentioned, I think, yesterday or today, managed mobility. It's managing, it's not that people are all stopped in their tracks. It's not that they're all pushed aside. It's the pacing of how they're moved and when they're moved to what places. Almost no plantations ever use local labor. It is always labor brought in for very specific services. Javanese brought to Sumatra. Javanese brought to Malaysia. Um, always, always a displaced labor force who cannot count on the agricultural labor of a set of a community and family. Here my archive is drawn not from connections I seek to make, but rather de Tourdonné, and he's not anybody special, and he's not anybody important. That's what I think is really, really interesting. He's not a name you're going to find again and again, but he's got a cognitive, visionary, and political map. Secondly, my archival map sticks close to the vocabulary we were talking about today, very close to how that vocabulary moved. His purview, which made almost no sense to me, includes religious colonies, military colonies, failed 17th century pauper colonies, and those active in the mid-19th century. There are children's agricultural colonies as well as retirement colonies for the infirm. A colonist could be a new French settler in Algeria, an adult inmate in a private establishment for paupers outside Paris, a penal colony inmate. His cartography spills across institutions of care and correction. His reference to these disparate forms captures something that contemporary studies of empire have since lost. And this is what I'm trying to recapture by not using my Eurocentric vision of what it should look like, how different notions of a colony should be organized, and who should rightly be in them was shared and compared across many, many more domains than we've actually looked at. Imperial expansion and modes of confinement, resettlement of delinquents, pauper programs, recruitment of empire's pioneers were not separately conceived and executed projects with different architects. These were political rationalities, not settled, but in constant reformation. De Tourdonnet teaches us something else. French blueprints for agriculture and pauper colonies drew on imperial rearrangements of people as much as the other way around. What appears now as seemingly indiscriminate ranges of comparisons referenced revives what were once politically tethered historical projects. That's one of the things we're always trying to get. What was politically tethered then, but may not be now? He looked at once to the Crimean colonies in the Russian South, to those established in the Amur Basin on the Chinese frontier, underscoring, how did he get that far, right? Not only the sweep of his comparative vision, but the poaching of practices that so marked cross-imperial knowledge acquisition and application. Appeal to Maitre was but a small node in this broader carceral net. Maitre's founder, de Metz, drew his inspiration in turn from Van den Bosch, who established the first private agricultural colonies for the criminalized poor in the Netherlands in 1817, and the forced cultivation system for Javanese farmers lasting some 30 years. So what I really wish I could do is a digitization on a map that's three-dimensional to get all of these forms in which these are being compared. In 1836, de Tourdonnet, this is great, he visited, Philadelphia, I'm sorry, de Metz visited 
Philadelphia's penitentiary to learn more about its acclaimed innovative system of cellular isolation, as de Tocqueville had done just several years earlier. Do you have to go? Oh. Um, and de Tocqueville praised the 1832 treaties on the children's agriculture. We're ba right back at, at de Tocqueville, right? The children's agricultural colonies that de Tocqueville also often quoted. The carceral archipelago of empire could be conceived not as a prelude to the modern, but the gradated sites of its instantiation. And that's one of the key points I want to make. As Deleuze and Guttari remind us, new concepts provide the conditions under which not only subject and object are redistributed, but also figure and ground. The political life of de Tourdenay's essay takes shape in the comments and critiques he makes about a range of containments and enclosures, in the kinships he turned from and those kinships he sought to claim. So what I'm trying to do is trace very closely, when did he go and say that's not really the same kind of thing? There are no straight historical lines that lead from these colonies agricoles to Guantanamo. Nor do the late 19th century reconcentration centers in Cuba or the German camps for the Herero provide a direct link to Nazi concentration camps or humanitarian refugee camps as some German historians have sought to claim. There's a lot of pushback on that right now. This is not the point. Reorienting our archival and conceptual maps has to do more than with a reversal of directionality. Rather, it raises new questions about the documents we call on and the archives we make of them. Key is the formulation of the kind of question we're asking. An imperial genealogy of security regimes is not an inexorable teleology of the present. That's not what I'm trying to get at. But it may help chart how political common sense is forged how relational histories are severed. I'd say one of the key understandings I have of imperial forms is that they sever relational histories that actually belong together. Such a genealogy would ask what durabilities of empire shape the distribution of displacements and the logics that underwrite containments today. Minor documents like de Tourdenay's offers, I think, an oblique, if chilling, perspective <laughs> on them. As Ducerteau so well understood, copying, binding, classifying are all practices, not of a preordained history, but as he said it so beautifully, of a history to be made, of a history to be made. The challenge in writing new colonial histories is just that, not histories that follow the well-honed paths that historians have traveled, but the possibility of imagining other ways of making what Disserteau saw as a critical task, to make, as he put it, an entirely different history possible. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for one more awesome presentation. And uh, we're just in the middle of the cycle. Uh, for you all probably know so much more about the subject than I. Oh, right? yeah, so right. Within the well, range of what you do. Actually, there are a lot of uh, colonial historians in the room that were not in the morning. So oh. I hope they are challenged by the and uh, instigated by the uh, brilliance of what you presented. And some may have some questions to but right now, so I'm going to open the room and uh, take questions. Marguerite and I will take an order of that. And Comments as well are just fine, not necessarily questions. OK, Paulo. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. And thank you very much. It's especially gratifying to see the way in which your lecture of today is building on yesterday's lecture and yet stands totally on its own as well. Uh, very impressive. 
I have a very short question with two points and a bit of context so you can understand mm. what the question actually is about. Uh, and I will be very short. I, you need not be. But I want to be because <laughs> I know other people have questions as well. Uh, but it's something that concerns me very much as part of the work that I do at Warwick together with colleagues in the Warwick Research Collective mm. in which we try to look at world literature as being the literature of the modern world system, which is a capitalist world system. Uh, in your um, lecture, there are many points in which I thought you were going to say it and then you didn't say it. I think that you're describing uh, in many ways precisely the working of the modern capitalist system. Absolutely. Uh, and so that is the context of my question, because in the beginning of the lecture, you stated something that I didn't know if I had misunderstood, so it's a question of clarification, but I thought that you had uh, mentioned that the forms of containment, uh, which I take to be one of your conceptual terms, um, is uh, the containment of people, that is, is a key element of the imperial modern. Right. So I, I thought that that was a crucial statement. I didn't it, want to absolutely. put words into your mouth, but I thought that you had said that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why it links to why I kept thinking she's going to, and then you never did. Well, the did. imperial modern for me, thank you for the question. Is actually, Can I give you the oh, second oh, point? Oh, I thought that no, no. was a question. The, 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 the second point to the question has to do with the fact that you mentioned that these um, functions of these colonies, uh, to use the French term colonies, as you used, not in uh, the other sense, that they were able to morph uh, from one function into the other. Yes. Uh, at crucial moments yes. historically yeah. uh, without disruption, so to speak. And I'm wondering if they also were able to um, preserve or whether they changed the form that they take. Yeah. Um, so the first question, thank you for it. When I, I mean, I was trained, again, I go back to being a Soissons in 68, um, on Wallerstein and the world capitalist system. Um, that's how I saw the world. That's what I read, that's what I cared about. I was trained as a Marxist and a feminist. Um, and that's uh, how I identified. When I think of the imperial modern, I'm really thinking of how capitalism operates very, very much. Um, you're right that I almost like assume that we know it. I call it the imperial modern because I think what happens in so much of the literature is the imperial is taken as an earlier moment and that we're really in another complex globalization moment that isn't imperial, and that the imperial actually ends much earlier. And if we look at all the different forms of containment that were maintained, it goes on such a long time, and it morphs into other forms. The work of Marc um, Bernadou uh, on, on the various camps that have almost a stratigraphy of sedimentation of people who have been concentrated in those sites is a really powerful example of, of the ways in which this goes up through the, 19, the 1950s. So I appreciate you um, saying maybe you should underscore that we are talking, I am going to actually be talking about it tomorrow quite a lot. No, that's not an excuse. I'm not using that as an excuse. And I love when people say, oh, that's in my other chapter, you know. No, I'm not saying that. I, I, I appreciate so much the question because I think there is a way, you know, I used to, when I wrote my dissertation, I talked about colonial capitalism. I mean, that was the phrase I used always in my dissertation. And I don't use it as much anymore. And somehow it has to do with the ways in which this imperial modern transgresses the boundaries of capitalism and Siberia and these various other sites seem to be part of it. But that doesn't mean it's not part of a world capitalist system because Siberia is part of it or the Amur Basin is part of it. Um, and I think that I need more articulation and more clarification of that. Um, so you, the other part of the question that you asked was about whether it retains its forms. That's what was so striking, is how much it retains its forms how much some of the forms of discipline in the military camps were actually the same forms of discipline that were used in the colonie agricole. That is the more eerie part of how these things operated, that, the, that the, the distance between them was so little, so little differentiation. 
of what these could be. Um, and at the same time, yes, sometimes they shifted, sometimes they changed, but it really depended who was writing on whether it was seen as a curative project, because we know that discipline is the best way to make a good citizen, right? How much discipline was too much t discipline? How much was actually in the service of these young colons? And that is where the literature um, really separates out. The, an entire French literature on social reform that almost never mentions Algeria. Never, never. Even though those very sites were set in part, not 100%, but set in part to train young settlers to be white settlers in the colonies. Um, I, I found that that really, so there's a whole section I didn't read for you on 1848 and why the dating of what happens in the revolutions of 1848, why they're so confused about how many people were thrown out of Paris. And it has to do with the fact that some people were thrown out as part of being revolutionaries. Some were sent out to be settlers. Some were sent out to be military, to occupy these new settler areas and to protect the settlers. And um, I sort of run through the whole gambit of why they come up sometimes with 48,000, sometimes with 12,000, sometimes. And so even I could even find myself making sense of the statistics because of this amalgamation of projects that were part colonial, part military, part ways of securing the nation. All, as Peter Redfield said, at the same time. They were, can't be reduced to any one of them. Um, and they were, they were kind, of, kind of laminated on top of one another in very strange, um, strange ways. And it's in Algeria where you really, really see it. And such a celebration of these children's agriculture needs that failed again and again. Kids would run away. Um, it was, you know, food wasn't enough. Nobody wanted to be there. Um, but they set up, first of all, uh, just one more little note, they had this, de Tordenay had this great idea, a whole gradation, so he'd start the first preparatory colonies in the north where it was a little cold. Then he'd start bringing them down to Roussillon and to Provence, where the kids would start used, get used to working in the heat. And then they'd bring them down to Algeria in this kind of succession of ways of acclimatizing them to hard labor. Um, This one, yeah. um, thanks. This resonates a lot with the questions I'm trying to grapple with concerning the continuities between different forms of containment in the mm. present relating to <coughs> migrant labor and so the deten migrant detention, migrant right. kind of uh, asylum seeker reception centers and uh, labor camps um, and to think about possible genealogies of this. Uh, uh, an attempt already during, for example, the fascist period to enlist uh, carceral uh, labor for land reclamation projects, right. which were Zizel. failed in some ways, right. but, uh, you know, so, um, and uh, you, you already, I think, partly answered my question or comment, I don't know, um, relating to the role of resistance, and so therefore the, the, the kind of ways in which failure uh, I mean, f failure meaning the resistance of the subjects that should right. be disciplined are then the m motors of subsequent kind of ways of imagining containment and discipline. Uh. Well, it's, it's a really hard question. It's always back to the subject and how do we get back to the subaltern subject. The ways in which you can get at some of it is very individuated, right? It's this kid ran away or the, this kind of kid ran away, or he was not well disciplined. It's very hard to get it, seeing it as a pattern. The place where it came clearest to me was in one of the colonies in Lambesque in, in Algeria, where literally they couldn't keep the kids at the colony. They just kept running one after the other, and they closed the colony. And that was one of those really successful forms. Um, the early, early, well, Jean Genet was at Maitre. Jean Genet was at Maitre. And 
you know, Jean Genet's sexuality is very, very related both to Palestinians and to Maitre. Um, this is where he was formed. Um, and there were people who really celebrated Maitre. It had all kinds of possibilities for kids who were living under bridges, right? Um, did somebody like Jean Genet resist it? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, there's a lot written about it. There's actually a dissertation recently written about, about it. And, I'll, and if I can find it, I'll pass it on to you. Because the ways in which people, well, we can see it at Calais. They were thrown out of Calais. And then people went and lived in the jungle, Le Jean. And then they went back after they were sent and, and sent to various villages outside in France, went back again to live in that same area again, right? Um, how politically affected these forms are, I don't know. I don't know, right? How much transgression, right, they, they, they perform in the face of those who don't want to see them, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's the question. How much is enough? How much is enough to tear it down, right? And this guy, Demetz, I mean, this was not a bad guy, quote unquote. This was a magistrate, very, very well established. Everybody loved him. Everybody wanted to visit him. Can you imagine setting up a hotel de colonie right there so everybody could come and look? and see what marginity meant, to really have a place where people take good care and don't mix them with adults, where it's for children so that they don't get abused. That was one of the, one of the central, of course, there was tons of abuse, but this cura coercion and curative quality is, is very powerful in it. Please. Yes, I can. Okay. I suppose following on from um, the previous question, this goes to the idea of what thinking along the grain rather than against the grain might obscure and to the point of resistance. I wonder if you could speak a bit more to that, to how much if you're trying to inhabit the categories that your subjects themselves um, inhabited, how much you feel that might obscure kind of resistance that's bringing into you other resistance. So along the grain is not only along the line of governance. Yeah. That's a misconstrual of what I, that is one of the lines. I'm not trying to say that's but there is. But along the, along the grain can also be along the ways in which, the, in which things are messed up, are not resistance in that form. I mean, you know, we can try to think, and I, I resisted it a lot, but with Jim Scott's notion of weapons of the weak, that there are all kinds of ways of moving in and out. Do I call this resistance, you know, that those boys all ran away? Um, and so you're saying the fact that you see them as <coughs> problems already, I mean, you're, I'm not accusing you of anything, that, because uh, uh, I'm trying to think with you that you see them as a problem is already in the classification of those who are in control. Could you see them another way? Could you see those boys as just, um, oh, one thing they said, they were bored. They were bored. They had nothing to do. Um, I, I don't know what to do with that kind of information. I mean, I wrote it, <laughs> put a footnote, but I don't know really what to do with that boredom. Um, um, help me, give me a, give me a, a, a thing that what you're thinking um, that would open it otherwise. I suppose this goes, when you say methodologically speaking, you don't want to impose, you're working more, more with an imminent I, sort of um, method of working with the category right. inside, inside the archive. Right, right. 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 
Yeah. Right. But your orientation to know how to sort of rethink that at mm-hmm. that moment if you're not reaching into something with yourself. I don't know. I mean, one, one of the few things that's helped me not decide I knew everything about how this worked was to understand that the curative was not always a subterfuge, which is what anyone working on colonialism assumes. Do you know what I mean? That if, it's, if, you're, if you're trying to be um, reformist, you're really just pulling the wool over everyone's eyes. And really, at the bottom of it was, was only violence. Now, I actually think that a politics of sympathy actually was very much a part of, of the colonial project. Not, not the difference in the colonial project, but actually. So understanding that other things were happening in these spaces, that there were multiple logics at work, loosens it up a little. It doesn't loosen it as much as you want. I agree. But it, it, at least I'm not reducing it to one logic. That, that's about as good as I've gotten. I'm, I, I would love the help in being able to turn it more to something that opens even more. Maybe if I knew more about the people who lived on the edges of these settlements, which I tried to find out about, right? Where people went. Did people harbor those kids who ran outside of them? How high were the walls? I've tried to find out how, how the, which ones had walls. Right? I've tried to find something out or just about what the environment is of that space and have not been very successful with it. Um, because the assumption would be that they were imprisoned. But actually, I don't think they were. I think that many of them chose to stay. Um, and what the terms of that are. It's very hard because it's really just Jean Genet who talked about, about what it was like to live at Met- a place like Maitre. There are f- very few um, autobiographical accounts. But it's a wonderful question and a hard one. Well, I'm always available on email if you decide. So we'll have more tomorrow. Come tomorrow, same time, same place for a continuation of this uh, uh, incarceration motion, which yep. is, is not about metre at all. It's about prisons and it's about confinement. All right. Well, thank you. Everybody.